Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Liza Bernard, and on behalf of the Norman Williams Public Library, I welcome you to our snapshot event, Environmental Humanities 101, Critical Studies for Feverish Times, with UVM professor Adrian Akad... I know I wish... Um, so we extend our thanks to our partners at Vermont Humanities as well as to the generous underwriters who make it possible for us to offer the weekly snapshot program. The sponsor of our entire season is the Vermont Department of Libraries, the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, and the Alma Gibb Staunchen Foundation. Tonight's event is underwritten by Pomerlo Real Estate. And thank you to Woodstock Community Television for the support with the live stream. This afternoon, we come together from across the state to listen, to learn, and to be inspired in community. But before we begin, I have a few brief housekeeping items. First of all, a reminder to turn off your phones and other noisy devices. And to note that the Norman Williams Library's next event is coming up Tuesday, the 28th, at 6, when Renee Berglund will talk about her book, Natural Magic, which is about Emily Dickinson, Charles Darwin, and the dawn of modern science. And the Vermont Humanities' final snapshot program of the season is the Dare to Dream event with actor David Mills. It will be at the Manchester Community Library, and it was rescheduled for next Wednesday, May 29th at 6 o'clock. And a reminder to be sure to register online if you want to receive a link to live streaming. And now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce, to introduce you to our speaker. Adrian Avankiv is Professor of Environmental Thought and Culture and the Stephen Rubenstein Professor of Environmental and Natural Resources at the University of Vermont. He is a UVM University Scholar and Public Humanities Fellow, a Fulbright Scholar, a Fellow of the Gould Institute and the Rachel Carson Center for Environmental, Environment and Society, and founder of Ecoculture Lab. He's also the author or co-editor of multiple books, including Ecologies of the Moving Image, 2013, Shadowing the Anthropos, I can never say this, Anthropocene, Echo Realism for Turbulent Times in 2018, and the Rutledge Handbook of Ecomedia Studies, which was published last year. And I understand he's working on a new one. So, and also starting in June, he will hold the J.S. Wood Woodsworth Chair in the Humanities at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. So without further ado, please help me welcome Adrian. I won't use that. Okay, great. Thank you, Liza, and thank you to all the sponsors that you mentioned and to Vermont Humanities for uh, asking me to do this, and to all of you for being here in person in, in this beautiful library in Woodstock on this scorching hot May day, or online in your scorching hot homes, maybe. All right, so this first image, um, and I do recommend that if you're seated far away, there's a lot of detail in some of the images, and I go through them um, with some speed, so I, I recommend sitting closer to the screen if possible. Uh, this first image more or less conveys what I want to talk about today. But I begin by acknowledging the land on which we're situated, land that for many centuries was stewarded by the Abenaki peoples. This history is one that the state of Vermont is still learning to reckon with, and I appreciate that this learning process is a um, sometimes challenging one, and, and uh, in fact, at the moment, a fraught one. This recognition is important in the context of what I'll be speaking about, because the environmental humanities encompass a historical perspective on how humans have developed ways of living, speaking, writing, representing, communicating, and transforming the world around us that are sustainable and mutually beneficial. Mutually beneficial, not just to humans, but to the many others we live with and depend on. 
Abenaki tr traditional practices, like indigenous practices elsewhere, offer important insights about how to live in particular places. In this case, in the place known as Indakina, which includes what's now called Vermont, but extends across a bioregionally more cohesive land of rivers and lakes, fields and woods, hills and valleys. And the history of relations between natives and waves of settlers with their rival alliances tells us much about how this land has changed and what has remained the same. And I'll talk about that. For that reason, it's important to know where to look for a more or less continuous knowledge of practices handed, handed down ancestrally through the centuries of colonialism, warfare, displacement, and what Anishinaabe writer Gerald Visenor calls survivance, a combination of survival and resistance. That many Abenaki live outside Vermont today does not eliminate the responsibility to acknowledge and invite them into our conversations today. That's something I and others have been trying to do at the University of Vermont and that I recommend that we all try to do in the state of Vermont. The other ancestors I would like to call upon are my own, who learned survivance in what's now Ukraine and whose relatives are still there fighting for that today. The relevance of that isn't just personal, as I argue in a book called Terra Invicta, uh, forthcoming in the next year, the, um, the war in Ukraine is largely a fossil fuel war, one fought by the world's second largest gas producer, third in production of oil, reliant on fossil fuel sales more than on anything else, whose leadership could see the writing on the wall about fossil fuels and their replacement by more sustainable sources of energy, and therefore came to the realization that a push toward re-imperializing itself would serve to strengthen its global status. Hopefully, most of us disagree with that realization. The experience of Ukrainians who didn't want to be re-imperialized and who have had to mobilize in many meanings of that word, both to fight, to retain their land, and to seek refuge from fighting with millions of displaced, around 10 million or so displaced internally or, or outside the country today still, is very much like the experience the entire world will face in decades to come in a world in which a rapidly destabilizing climate will exacerbate political conflicts, cultural conflicts, conflicts over resources and over borders, even as it intensifies the flow of migrants and refugees, of viruses, of information and disinformation, and much more. So if you were wondering what indigenous people and fossil fuel wars might have to do with the environmental humanities, you've come to the right place. About two and a half years ago, I was invited to give a talk for Vermont Humanities on climate change, and I spoke on climate change, ecotrauma, and the Anthropocene, uh, in which I presented multiple ways of thinking about this latter term, so just quick definition. The Anthropocene is a term proposed by Earth scientists, uh, debated for 20 some years <coughs> by the geologists, as a description of the current era in which human activities have altered the surface of the earth um, in ways that we can't go back and have in fact changed the composition of the atmosphere and much more. Um, I showed a lot of visuals in that talk, including underwater art by this artist, Jason DeCare Taylor, that talk is still online, and all of it remains relevant, so I won't repeat myself today. Instead, I'll do something that's both pre more preliminary, which is to talk about the humanities, why they should environmentalize, 
and what that means in the 21st century. And secondly, I'll do a little bit of updating, specifically on that term, Anthropocene. And I'll do these two things more or less simultaneously. So if you find yourself feeling a little bit lost on, on terminology or wanting to hear more, I do recommend that you uh, look for that earlier talk called The Zone Is Us. It's online when you get a chance. So why environmental humanities? But let's start by asking another question. How do we define the present moment in time and in history? And here, if this were a classroom, I would stop and ask students to discuss this and to come up with ideas and to kind of hash things out for a little while. Uh, we only have a small number of you here, but if anyone has an idea of how to define the present time, I'd love to hear it. That gives me an opportunity to have a drink of water. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I'll make it easy. And we would need like, you know, 10 minutes or something. 10 minutes, really yeah. Because yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like starting to think about it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to need a little bit more time. <laughs> and, if, and if there were a chat that I could see online, that I'd see if anyone else is suggesting anything, but I, I can't. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll list some ways in which the present is thought of. Generally, the way this is done is as a kind of dialogue between historians who study the past, influential, politically influential figures, kings and queens, heads of state, religious leaders, and so on, and common people, the masses, so to speak. Some answers that we find today are chronological ones, so 21st century, the contemporary world, whatever that means. Of course, 100 years ago was the contemporary world too, so that's not very informative. Then there are generational ways of defining the present, and that's just, uh, you probably can't read that if you're here in the room. Generation Alpha, born after the year 2000. I don't see any, anyone representing that generation in this room. So generation Z, Gen Z, Gen X, and so on and so forth. Then there are political ways of defining things. Uh, some of these uh, refer to political leaders, heads of state, figures like Queen Victoria, the Victorian era, the Napoleonic era, the Gilded Age, which tells us something about politics in that period of American history, etc. Or sometimes historians talk about long centuries or sometimes short centuries, the American century being the 20th century. So what are we in now? Well, there's debate about maybe China is stepping up to take some sort of more prominent, more definitive role in the 21st century. We don't know. Other ways, look to watershed events the post-war era, the post-1960s era, the post-Cold War, post-9-11 America, etc. So looking back to some event that changed things. Then there are techno-economic ways of defining the present, the industrial era, the electronic era, the communications era, the information age, and so on. Cultural, civilizational ways of defining things, and we're probably familiar with that trinity of ancient world, medieval world, modern world. If you grew up in the 20th century, especially in Europe, that's what you grew up with, that kind of uh, compartmentalization of history. When does the modern world start? Well, then you get into more fine details about the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and so on and so forth. So we live in a time that isn't exactly defined yet by many people. So when geologists entered the field of defining the present, it was a signal to others that, hey, there's something interesting going on. Geologists are something like the turtles of the scientific world. They work on the slowest time scales, and their work is the basis for defining the longest time periods. But it wasn't actually geologists who came up with the, the idea of the Anthropocene. It was an atmospheric chemist, Paul Crutzen, 
and a limnologist or freshwater ecologist, Eugene Stormer, who published something in the newsletter of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program of the International Council of Scientific Unions in the year 2000 called the Anthropocene, proposing that this be the name of our time. It took another nine years for geologists to agree to set up a committee or working group to examine the question of whether the Anthropocene should qualify as what geologists call an epoch. And this logo, actually, uh, for the Anthropocene Working Group uh, follows the rate of change of atmospheric carbon dioxide over 20,000 years. So, yes, there's a bump that's, that coincides with a lot of other bumps over the last uh, 75 years, some of them over the last 150 years, and there have been debates over when the Anthropocene starts and many ways of dating it. It took another seven years for that working group to decide that it should, uh, that the Anthropocene should be a geological epoch, the current epoch. Another seven years for that group to develop a proposal for that, which required identifying a place on Earth, colloquially known as a golden spike, where the change from the previous epoch, the Holocene, to the proposed new e epoch, the Anthropocene, could be shown, demonstrated with crystal clarity, and that ended up being this lake in the top right corner there uh, in southern Ontario called Crawford Lake. Actually, I think I added seven years to my, my chronology there. So we're at 2016, no, that's right, 2023. Uh, I didn't. And it took less than a year, in fact, about half a year, for that proposal to be rejected, which shocked some people including some of the geologists involved who cried foul, especially given how quickly the vote occurred after such a long period of deliberation. Meanwhile, we've been told by all manner of media since at least 2011 that we have entered the Anthropocene. So what does that mean? Well, to make a long story short, the rejection by the international body of geologists of the idea of naming the Anthropocene the current epoch is a rejection not of the Anthropocene idea, but of its being accepted as a geological epoch. Geologists have never before named an epoch that has been entered into during the time of the existence of geology itself. So up to now, for something to be an epoch, it has had to have a clear beginning and a clear end no end at this point to the Anthropocene. So what it's come down to is that those who argue that the Anthropocene should be an epoch were defeated by those who maintain that the Anthropocene, and it's more complicated than this, but some, some of the key people maintain that the Anthropocene is better thought of as an event, a watershed event, kind of like those ones that I mentioned like the 1960s or like 9-11, a game changer that has initiated some set of changes, but we cannot know what or how or when things will restabilize and around what set of conditions. <coughs> we know the last 11,700 years or so, and it's pretty precise, what geologists call the Holocene, has been stable enough to enable the flourishing of human civilizations, we are now entering uncharted territory, according to proponents of the idea of the Anthropocene event and the Anthropocene epoch. So let's think some more about what it means to name an epoch or an event after the species that has come to dominate so much of what is happening on the Earth. This is Google's engram for the word Anthropocene, which shows us the use of that word in all the books documented in Google. Uh, it came into use, as I mentioned, around the year 2000. It began an upward curve around 2008, 
And here if I use my little thing, as you see. And then um, spikes up pretty rapidly around 2012 and continues. Bit of a dip, but pretty well continues. Here's the engram for environmental humanities, our term for the day. A term that starts being used a little later, around 2007, 2008, and begins an almost identical ascent up also at around 2012. So it follows that same curve. And the, uh, I, I distinguish between the capitalized environmental humanities, EH uh, capitals, versus the other one, only because if you look, at, look into the fine points, and there are variations of this where you really dig into details, you'll see that the two separate towards the end, and I speculate that it's because environmental humanities is used more as an official term for institutes and centers and things like that. But anyway, let's leave that aside. So why environmental humanities? Well, there are now dozens of academic programs, centers, institutes, associations, and journals in environmental humanities. I want to give you a little bit of the history of that and a sense of what's at stake in this recent development. Here's just a small sampling of books with environmental humanities in the title. As you can see, there's environmental humanities in China, in Africa, in the Himalayas, in folk tales and disability studies, in the ancient world, in the 18th century, and so on. Here's another sample of books that don't have environmental humanities in the title, but that are very much uh, fit within the field. And they range from theater, religion, uh, eco-aesthetics, eco-cinema, and eco-art, and all kinds of other things. This is the field that I have worked in since before the term actually was used. It's important to realize that up until now, most studies of the natural world have looked to the natural sciences. Die Naturwissenschaften in the original German, to which our academic system of disciplines is indebted, while studies of the human cultural world have looked to the social sciences and humanities. Die Geisteswissenschaften, with a very clear demarcation between the two. Most disciplines in Universities fall either on one side of the line or on the other side of the line. You learn different methods, research methodologies, and so on. For comparison's sake, the budget of the National Sciences Foundation at nearly $10 billion is about 50 times that of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts, and roughly that visual size as well. Of course, to do science costs more money than to do the kind of stuff that I usually do, uh, but it's telling. So what's the difference between the sciences and the humanities, and what does it mean for something like environmental humanities to question that division of labor? <coughs> Here's where, if this was a classroom, I would again break us up in, into groups to see how we define what science is, what the humanities are, where the social sciences fit in. I'll just give you my quick rundown of some key differences and uh, leave it at that. So the natural sciences try to understand how the world works. They seek patterns, meaning, logic in it. They seek an accurate correspondence between the patterns that they find and the patterns in the world, so that the representation, the laws, the theories, etc., the theory of evolution, theory doesn't mean somebody's idea about something, it's actually the, the most well-established thing there is in science, so that those representations, those ideas, correspond to the reality that they are describing. An example of how this works, uh, Newtonian physics sort of ruled the world of physics up until 
enough anomalies sort of gathered together and people came along and started trying to explain those anomalies that didn't fit into things. And eventually what we loosely call Einsteinian physics uh, was, was over time and there was some kind of, uh, it took some time for physicists to come around to it, over time became the ruling paradigm that more closely corresponds to observed data about the universe, certainly at the subatomic levels, at the, at the uh, large and small levels, where Newtonian physics doesn't seem to explain things as well, and therefore there's prog progress. And that's how science progresses. One paradigm replaces a previous one because it does better at explaining the world. So where do the social sciences fit in? Well, they're sort of similar. They try to understand the social world in the same sort of way, but the human social world is pretty complex, and we are part of it, and therefore it's a lot more difficult to make sense of, arguably, and there are different theoretical perspectives on how to make sense of it. So it doesn't come up with such clear, um, let's say, consens consens consensuses <laughs> on how society works as the physical sciences do, the biological sciences, and so on. What about the humanities? And I kind of add the arts to the picture here. They aim not so much to understand how things work, but to understand and appreciate the human world, human meanings, the ways we make sense of our lives, our efforts to live. They're guided not so much by the ideal of, of correspondence to reality, but by very contestable ideals. We don't necessarily agree on the ideals, on what truth is, or beauty, or justice, or goodness, or what other things are we looking for in our lives. Harmony, coherence, creativity, insight, value, etc. So there are different ideals guiding the humanities and the study of the humanities. Still, there are things that we recognize should be taught. They're important. Shakespeare, the Bible, the Mahabharata, and other sorts of things from around the world provide valuable insights into the human condition. But the premises on which we decide what's a valuable insight for us can change. History used to be taught according to something like the great man or the great powers view of history where it's the important, usually male leaders, Napoleon and others, who should be the focus of the study of history. And that's pretty well changed. Now we understand that there's something that could be called people's history. Views of human life from below, from the grassroots. There's a pluralism of different perspectives that we appreciate in the humanities, that we want our students to understand and appreciate. So paradigmatic diversity, diversity of perspectives, is not just tolerated, but generally encouraged, not by everybody, maybe, but, but I would hope so, for the most part. And there's an understanding that still we try to work toward consensus to the extent that we can, because we need to live together. So it's not so much representation corresponding to being equal to reality as a recognition that reality itself and our ways of making sense of it interact with each other. They can't be separated. We can't take ourselves out of the picture that we're studying. All right. So the humanities use all kinds of different methods, and I'm just going to flash a bunch of words at you right now. <laughs> and uh, a bunch of different ways of conducting research. Feel free to, I assume this is being recorded, and you can go back to the talk if you find these slides interesting or, or informative in any way. So the environmental humanities also include a range of different perspectives that have emerged over the last, 
I would say 60 years or 70 years, something like that. Since about the 1960s, the environment becomes a theme in different disciplines that make up the humanities that have now come together into this interdisciplinary environmental humanities field. But they arguably agree on at least one two-part premise, which is that there is a crisis in relations between humans and the natural world, and that science and te technology will not alone solve that crisis. We need arguments, images, rhetoric, motivation, habits, visions, sensibilities, desires. We need all those things that the arts and humanities give us in order to actually address our environmental, our global, our deep 21st century challenges successfully. And we're far from there yet. The second premise that I want to add, which not everyone in the environmental humanity subscribes to, but I would say that, that there's a pretty large um, body of, of scholars who do, which is that for understanding these complex environmental, which are always also social, socio-ecological issues, we have to understand that the separation of culture and nature in our thinking is a flawed premise. It gives us difficulty. And this is the idea that C.P. Snow, 70 years ago or something, called the two cultures, the sciences and the humanities. Things have changed, but we still have, still tend to separate things. We need an ontology, and there's a definition of that term, an account of what there is and what and how it is, and an epistemology, an account of how we know anything, how we know what we know, how we know what things are. We need an ontology and an epistemology that's adequate to this new situation that some call the Anthropocene. All right, to give you an example of what I mean by this ontological challenge, let's take a popular cultural phenomenon, Netflix's three-body problem. How many of you have watched any part of it? Hopefully people online have. Okay, so very popular series on Netflix, uh, seven-part, eight-part series, uh, based on Chinese science fiction author, very highly celebrated, esteemed science fiction author, Xixin Liu, um, on a trilogy of novels, the first of which is called The Three-Body Problem. I'm going to speak more to the Netflix series than to the novels, which are a little different in what I'm going to illustrate, but not entirely different. The three-body problem is about humanity's encounter with an alien race, the Santi or the Trisolarans. Trisolarans because they have three suns in their star system, who have emerged in a star system that is a three-body system. A three-body system is a classic example of an unpredictable system. So one, two, three, and this is presumably the planet where the Trisolarans live. Uh, there are such systems in the, our galaxy even, let alone the rest of the universe. There are two body, two star systems. A three-body system is Scientists take to be pretty classic for something that you really can't predict. It's just too complicated. Mathematicians haven't quite cracked it. There's some debate over that. But what happens in this kind of system is that each of the three similar bodies, the three suns, the three stars, exert gravitational pulls on each other that are only stable for limited periods and whose stability cannot be predicted. The alien race, the Santi, has developed the means to rapidly dehydrate themselves and go into a kind of deep freeze state between one stable period and the next. They don't know when the next one will come along, so there's some way of keeping tabs on 
on the atmosphere, the climate, the situation with the suns, and so on, so that they can rehydrate and come back to life between, uh, through these in unstable chaotic systems, uh, periods which are either frozen worlds or hothouse worlds. Now, there's, there's, there's relevance for us because the Earth has, in fact, gone between uh, frozen worlds and hothouse climates um, for, you know, even not so long ago. Our current period, as I mentioned, the Holocene is only about 12,000 years old when we've had this relatively stable, uh, conducive climate for the flourishing of human civilization. And if we are entering a less stable climate, as earth scientists and geologists kind of concur, then there's another lesson for us. How are we going to deal with that? How do we prepare for it? And uh, that's why I think this stuff is actually the most important thing for all of us to be thinking about today. But that's me. All right. So the question here, the problem, let me go back to, to so, so the problem for me with the three-body problem, as it's portrayed in the Net Netflix series, is that it shows this alien race as developing the means to be a highly technological spacefaring civilization. They can travel, in fact, in the series, they travel to the Earth. It takes them four centuries because that's, that's how far light speed is, uh, four light years away, and that's the closest. It's sort of loosely based on Alpha Centauri, I think the clo our closest so, uh, star system companion, uh, not entirely based on that. So they, they're a spacefaring technological civilization, and from an ecological perspective, that's completely impossible on a planet that is so unstable because civilizations like that don't just emerge on their own. They don't fall from the sky. They emerge in a context that harbors them, enables them to live, to flourish, to evolve with other life forms that become their allies, without which you know, if, if the atmosphere is unstable, then those other life forms also won't survive. So they would have to go into this deep freeze, which isn't depicted here. So in other words, th there's this idea that a species like humans can evolve on its own to be this superior technological civilization. And that is ecologically completely un... Um, it's an unsustainable idea because we, at least based on our example here on Earth, could not have evolved without all the things that make us up, the microbes that are in our bodies, that make up our, the neurons in our brain, the water cycles, the carbon cycles, the animals that we depend on, that are our companions, our dependents, and so on, uh, the plants, etc. All of that makes us part of a biosphere and actually viewed historically part of very specific biospheric conditions, ecosystems. So that's the point that I want to make by critiquing this kind of three-body problem idea that we could possibly <coughs> exist on our own. So the question here is whether humans are simply humans individuals or groups who can find themselves in any situation and move around at will, uh, like some of us do today, those with the privilege to move across borders freely. And I'm myself one of those people. This is my um, third academic university institution that I've worked for, and on, I'm on my way to my fourth. So what does it mean to move around at will? because you get hired by places. Not everyone can today. Some people get stopped at borders, as we know. So are we humans who can do anything we want, or are we bound up in relationships, in multi-species entanglements with others, with people, animals, plants, land, 
microbes, weather systems and climate regimes, and much more. This, um, which you can't really see very well, uh, is an attempt to describe one such relationally entangled world in the form of a seasonal calendar produced by the Wallalaku Aboriginal Corporation in Australia, working with Griffith University's Australian Rivers Institute, summarized in a recent paper entitled, as you can see there, Sustainability Crises Are Crises of Relationship, co-authored by three senior women custodians of Nyakina country and Nyakina knowledge, and two non-indigenous social scientists. And a lot more of the kind of work that I'm drawing on is done in these kinds of collaborative uh, ways than, than used to be the case. So we have two very different ontologies, two very different ways of making sense of the world here. In one, human identity is forever separate or separable from land, which is considered resource, property, object, commodity, and the same can be said for water and other elements. Something to be possessed, bought and sold, turned into profit, etc. Which is the same duality as the one that underlies this separation, this division of labor between the natural and the social or cultural, the natural sciences and the humanities. In the other ontology, there has never been a humanity separate from land, from country, from earth, or in some cases from water, from ocean. There's always only been people plus land, a collectivity that emerges in and through the relations that enable it to thrive over multiple generations. This is precisely how indigeneity is defined <coughs> in the three examples here from indigenous scholars, Robin Wall Kimmer, Leanne Bethesa Mosake Simpson, uh, who's, both of whom are not that far away from us geographically, and George Sefadei and his co-authors who are actually based in Toronto. I won't read these, but they're there if you'd like to read them. But they essentially articulate that point. And in fact, the severance of that relationship between people and land, either through a sudden rupturing or through a gradual thinning via colonization, dispossession, displacement, fragmentation, and so on, constitutes the very active process of making the modern world, the modern colonial extractive capitalist, etc world that we live in. So there are the colonizers coming in and saying, people are people. Well, they, it took them a couple of centuries to figure out whether indigenous people qualified as people. There was a lot of debate over that and so on. Where they rank, so then there was a kind of ranking system developed. We're hopefully beyond that. Land is land. It's to be owned. Um, bought and sold, turned into squares like we have here in Vermont, and so on. People can be moved around, bought and sold initially, now employed and studied. Land can be bought and sold, developed and studied, and so on. So this brings us to the Humpty Dumpty question. Can we bring people and land together again in some way, or at the very least, what would it mean to try in the 21st century to bring people and land together in ways that could sustain themselves for generations on this earth? In some ways, this is what the environmental humanities have been attempting to do, or at least to explore. Um, environmental humanities scholar Greg Garrard, for instance, has depicted this as the ecologizing of humanity, of the humanities, of the study of human history, of humanity itself and our understanding of ourselves, and at the same time, the humanizing of ecology, so that it's not this separate thing that is about how these 
objects at their work, but so that it's this world that we dwell within and intermingle with in our everyday lives. Another uh, recent article from Environmental Humanities Journal has kind of surveyed a lot of literature in the field and come up with five key ideas that this group of scholars, uh, 21 of them actually, including some key people, have, have uh, that they propose are canonical ideas in the environmental humanities. The first of these, and they'll be familiar to you if you've been listening, uh, is that there is no singular human, no singular humanity. And therefore, the idea of the Anthropocene, that human activities have altered the face of the Earth, isn't quite very helpful, because there are different kinds of humans who live differently, who have lived differently for generations in different places. And we need to keep those differences in mind if we are to develop better ways of living. Second idea, there is no singular environment. The stuff out there, the environment as this kind of global thing that's out there outside humanity. Uh, so that dualism really doesn't help us. The third key idea is that we need grounded thinking, case studies that study lived worlds that do field work. They're not just in books, but they actually go out and work with communities. Potentially Vermont landscape from the 1850s at the height of agriculture. And you know that Vermont was 80%, 20% um, forest in, in the late 1800s and is now 20% non-forest or something like that. It's pretty close, it's reversed. So the height of agriculture um, being replaced by farm abandonment. Why did the sheep farmers and dairy farmers abandon, abandon Vermont? Because they were losing out to the farms in the Midwest. They were part of a much larger economic system and people left the land, left the state, which meant that certain kinds of trees either bounced back or were planted and eventually white pine got succeeded by hardwoods, by maple trees, which we're, we're now famous for. Uh, this is 1930, forest of hardwoods, and Killington today. And there are all kinds of other places where I've seen the exact same thing. It's all forest. It's second growth forest, whatever that means little patches of old growth here and there, but again, old growth is a relative term. Very different from the forests that were here 500, 600, 700 years ago, which were much more lived in, which were managed forests, managed by the people who lived here, who here would have been, I think, Abenaki in this part of Vermont. Again, Vermont today, as we romanticize it maybe as we sell it to others to come and visit and buy our local maple syrup and Ben and Jerry's ice cream and ski our guilds and so on, uh, as it may look if we took our energy commitments a little more seriously, but I won't get into that. So 20,000 years ago, the land that we are on looked a little like this a mile of ice. And that actually extended for about 70,000 years or something like that. 10,000 years ago, Burlington, where I've worked for the last 21 years, looked more like this. As for Woodstock, I hadn't looked into it, but I suspect it was on the shores of a river that was near to its mouth at one of the glacial lakes that crisscrossed what's now Vermont and New England. The deposition of terminal moraines and other landscape features at the end of the glacial era led to the lake-filled, valley-crossed, riverine landscape that was then lived in by indigenous generations of indigenous people, so that it looked maybe something like this about a thousand years ago. What it will look like in another thousand years is anyone's guess. 
not like this. That's my guess. We are in uncharted waters. All of which prompts us to think about the nature and shape of time, and I'm wrapping up here. Uh, in that previous talk that I, that I gave for Vermont Humanities, uh, I discussed different ways of thinking about time as chronos, as kairos, as ion, using these Greek terms for how we place ourselves within history. Here I'll just uh, reiterate a couple of, of the themes of this talk. So is time something like this, where one thing follows another and then sinks beneath it as a historical and ultimately geological layer? In which case, what's going to come and sink on top of our layer? Is it more like a spiral? And this is also a geological kind of time map. How is time actually lived? And that's where I leave that question for you to consider your own lives. Uh, and I'll just add a couple of quotes, uh, perspectives to add to the way we think of time. The past that is not past reappears always to rupture the present. This is African-American author Christina Sharp from a book called In the Wake, which is a meditation on the past that brought African people to the Americas as slaves and that reappears to rupture the present still today in our time. A quote from uh, Vilashini Kupan from a, a, an article called Time Maps. Time can be Euro-chronological, so we've seen a bit of that, or it can be post-colonial. It can be messianic and melancholic. It can be gridded into periods or entangled, hard like the iron hands of a clock or soft like the swells of the sea. Third quote about the entanglement that the last quote refers to. Entanglement is a condition that interlocks presents, pasts, and futures that retain their depths of other presents, pasts, and futures, each age bearing, altering, and maintaining the previous ones. African philosopher Ashil Mbembe, my final quote uh, from Nils Bubant from a book called The Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet. Undecidability is the signature characteristic, the curse and the promise of the current moment. I leave you with that. Thank you. Do you want to take some questions? Or... Absolutely, yeah. Okay. The only thing, we don't have a mic for questions, so if you could repeat them. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for easy to read, not super academic books on the environment of humanity? Like I read the Michael Mann book, Our Fragile Moment, and it was just like, I cannot wrap my mind around all of these, mm. you know, things. I can't picture what 500 million years looks, you know, do you know what I mean? So is there, Something accessible? There are a lot of things. I just I'm not sure where to start. That's a great question, and I should have a ready answer to it. Um, but there's it's all there. Well, yeah, that's a historical kind of. Yeah, but it's sort of the idea. What, what did you say? Edward Abbey with desert salt. Yeah, so I would, I would have the students read that, and then we would put it into its context and think yeah. about how that context has changed. Yeah. <laughs> but for current, current environmental humanities, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see that as a kind of historical. But you're trying to cultivate the uh, soul of the thing more yeah. than the science of the thing, essentially. Right. right. The science yeah, I mean, there are so many writers that, that, that do that, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Derek Jensen writes a lot. Derek Jensen, yeah, yeah, if you want some radical energy. Yeah, um, or that's sort of also, he talks a lot about that sort of thing. Sure. Sure. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to share a, a list of things, but I'd have to give a little thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you email me, my email is pretty easy to find. It's just my um, first initial, the last name at uvm.edu. I'll I'll share some suggestions. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah. Um, how do people? scholars in the field of environmental humanities feel about uh, things like the flooding that happened in Vermont last year in regards to planning for the future. You know, there are offices in Montpelier and some people say, abandon it, it's going to be underwater. Other people say, build it up so that it can withstand the next thing. And I think about that word withstand as opposed to a coexistence. And I wonder if there's a, a part of environmental humanities that can help uh, sort of teach people about coexistence and sort of ecological humans with the land in the face of these very real potential catastrophes. Yeah, definitely plan ahead. Don't build in places that will be flooded or that will be ravaged by wildfires every other year or, or that, yeah, that, sure. So, so reading up on some of the uh, projections of coming years and the impacts of climate change and that sort of thing is always useful. Um, for Vermont specifically, I mean, we're pretty well situated compared to some places in some parts of the world uh, so we can expect more people moving to Vermont and that becomes a kind of question how do we welcome them in and make sure that there's uh, I mean, we're not going to put a wall around Vermont presumably uh, in a capacity to do that uh, so we have to think about how to how to plan uh, for our communities uh, moving forward um, yeah, uh, I mean, if, if you're seeing flooding now, you'll probably see it again. And we used to call them 100-year floods or 500-year floods or something, and now we're not so sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is kind of a complicated question. Um, when I think about the Anthropocene, it seems like it's a very, as we kind of try and grope our way towards a relationship with the world we're in, identifying something as the Anthropocene seems, or, or worrying about it so much, seems almost bloody-minded on a certain <laughs> level. <laughs> is that essentially the, the geologists are probably right that there's not enough plutonium or aluminum cans or pig bones out there to definitively say we are now in the Anthropocene in the geological record. I mean, and I understand the, the the reasoning behind that is kind of to raise awareness or, or to say this is happening. But if, I, I wonder if, if it's at all ultimately a useful construct for explaining or, or for groping toward having a better relationship for most people. Yeah, that's how I think that's how humanities people have tended to think of the Anthropocene. It's a way to get, get us thinking differently. And there have been other terms that people have come up with that, that haven't caught on the way the Anthropocene has, I think because it's coming from the sciences. Um, you know, I would say that geologists probably mostly agree that there is enough plutonium and enough plast plastics in our bodies and everywhere to, to, to make a layer. I mean, it's pretty much all over the world, these very fine particles from atomic bomb tests of the 1950s and so on. Uh, it's not that there isn't enough of that, it's that we don't know yet what to do with it. You know, we, don't, we can't call it an epoch because we're not sure what it means, we're not sure when to begin that epoch. It's some, uh, some, some geologists have proposed that it goes all the way back to the beginning of the Holocene. So we just rename the Holocene Anthrop Anthropocene, or we just keep calling it Holocene and say that, well, this is a process that's been going on for 12,000 years. 
so, so there's too much um, debate still around what it means to, uh, to name something the Anthropocene and what it is that's being named. There are epochs, there are eras, there are, there's five levels of things. I forget where they all fall. Epoch is sort of the smallest. Um, so, so the debate is more a kind of semantic debate, uh, but I, yeah, I, I agree with you that the term is sort of used, and even some of the geologists who've been pushing for it to be accepted as, as the name of our epoch have admitted that, yes, we, we need people to think about this. That's, that's part of the reason why we're making this case. Uh, yeah. Now what's going to happen with the term 10 years from now? I don't know. We'll probably still have it, I think. Uh, what, is, what, what sort of capacity do you see the approach of environmental humanism, humanities, to uh, counteract the dominant corporate, corporate consumer narrative that is uh, propagandized into our very DNA at this point? Um, people are, will, are impossibly reluctant to abandon even the slightest thing. And on what time scale could that even be possible? Yeah, that's, that's the question. Sorry? Oh, sorry, yes. So the question is, um, uh, you phrased it really well. Can you say it at the beginning again? Um, what capacity does environmental humanities or humanism have to challenge the right. dominant okay. narrative? Yeah, yeah so what, what capacity do people in the environmental humanities feel that we have for challenging the dominant and what uh, outlet? Sorry? And what outlet? And what outlet? outlet? Yeah. So the dominant worldview in which we are consumers who who want to keep getting those things that our society produces and and yeah, all of that. I mean we all we all know that. That's yeah. we've grown up in a world where there are things. You walk down the street and there are so many beautiful things you can buy in Woodstock. They're all little things that you can put on a shelf or something like that. And uh, they've been produced. Somebody has to make a living and so on. Do we need all that stuff? Well, that's, that's a question Derek Jensen really <laughs> asks really well. He has a long list of things made from plastic. And he says, basically, do we need any of these things? And ultimately, I think the answer will have to be no, because plastics are not, uh, not feasible yeah. <laughs> alternatives. And we need to, to satisfy those needs for whatever the need is that's being uh, satisfied by our buying one thing or another. And it could be something we really need. You need to have a kitchen that's equipped with certain things so you can make food. We need to eat, we need to have shelter. And so so people do this in very simple ways and have for 200,000 years. Of yes. So yes. people say, oh, we need plastic packaging, but they forget that 20 years ago there wasn't plastic packaging. Everything came in paper and biodegradable containers. Yeah. But oh no, we cannot do without it. Well, we you know. to, we're told we need to consume with the religion. We need to consume. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it keeps our economy. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's almost holy, like in this little town. It, Everybody has to shop. We need more visitors. We need to drive more people in here so that we can buy yeah. and support the local business. Yeah. yeah. Consumerism is a religion. So what you're identifying is that there are so many levels on which we need to change our priorities so or our way, ways of doing things. Uh, so what capacity do we have doing that? Um, Fortunately, I think, this is my answer, I'm an optimist in the sense that I think that when change happens, it happens quickly. For a long time, it doesn't happen. But there are moments at which people are sort of pushed against the wall and they realize that, yeah, this is no longer sustainable. Or things have been taken from us and we realize we've got to shift. And there are historical, you know, I think actually the, the university should be focused on uh, I'm reframing my argument. We shouldn't environmentalize the humanities and humanize the study of the environment. We need to focus on change and how to make change and how change has happened historically. 
and where it's been successful and where it's been unsuccessful. Revolutions often, maybe mostly, fail to bring about their desired results. They often bring about worse results. So we gotta get better at making change and at figuring out how change happens. But I do think that when it does happen, it happens quickly. We're not there yet, we're moving into it. When it'll happen, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I work for Vermont Humanities, and one of the things that we are trying to do is help people build this new muscle memory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like a, a good example of this and how environmental humanities needs to do that thing that makes people click into it is like the typewriter to the computer. People wanted adoption of computers, so they didn't redesign the keyboard. They used the exact same one that everyone had learned on as they were learning the typewriter mm -hmm. when they designed the computer keyboard so that people wouldn't, di wouldn't discount it because it was a new thing that they had to learn that was a different process. So I think it seems as though building that muscle memory and tapping into an existing process rather than trying to reinvent it, um, it is a way to not stifle that change. So should I repeat the comment or is that? Oh no, they can, they can actually hear pretty well. Okay. I think the people on the screen. And along the same lines, um, what was I thinking? Oh. I love we need to anthropomorphize things all the time. We, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I call the bees in our garden people. Um, do you see that as like helping? And I consider flowers meal plans. Um, do you consider that like part of that change? Like if we start seeing everything as people, as kin, yeah. as yeah. our really relations. Yes, I do see that as part of the change. Yeah, absolutely, because we, we have a different relationship to those that we know. We depend on, they depend on us. And bees, absolutely. Well, let, your, let your lawns grow and invite them in, and yeah. yeah. I mean, there's this whole like biblical thing about, you know, we are masters of this domain and everything is for our consumption and stuff like that. And this is still mm -hmm. very, very much the mindset. And, mm -hmm. Who cares about these, or whatever. Yeah, I remembered what my point was going to be. So along the same lines of, you know, there are things that, that stay the same, even as there are dramatic changes. I mean, in the last 30 years, we've seen the, the internet really revolutionize the world. In the last 20 years, social media, they all do it in this kind of haphazard, unplanned way that's not managed well at all, that, that serves some people much more than it serves others. But ultimately, they provide new tools. Um, and, and, and I see that kind of change as possible on a pretty short time scale. So it's only really been the last decade where we've talked about climate change the way that we are talking about it now, climate justice and things like that. Not everybody, obviously. It's, too politicized, it's too, it's been drawn into this kind of, ever since Al Gore wrote a book on it, he was a Democrat, Republicans said, no, we don't want any of that. And there was a kind of separation, which you don't have in other countries. So, so, so politics and, uh, does funny things to our capacity to work together on the issues that, that confront us all. But I, I do think that change can happen quickly. Uh, you're thinking, but you, you, you're starting to say something. I, well, I was just, um, that quote from Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. that quote, how many, I think about um, how few people probably feel that way. I think that's kind of a big problem mm -hmm. with our, just the human population is how many people are feeling that deep connection that I am one with the environment, uh, the, the natural environment I am around. I was just like in a city recently and I was thinking, how many people are connecting here to, to anything? Hopefully, maybe a tree in their yard or something, but do they even have a tree? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just the lack of connection, I think, doesn't help with the change that needs to happen. And living more and more in a synthetic reality of the internet, make-believe yeah. games, and all this kind of thing, you know, where you can forget about right. the discomfort and move on to something more entertaining. 
Yeah. And these are all huge oh. challenges for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have one online question. Okay. Um, the question the person asks, with skepticism that still exists with some populations and climate change, do you have any recommendations on how to approach these conversations? Uh, okay, I'll repeat the question. So recommendations for how to approach conversations around climate change with, uh, given the skepticism that exists in certain places. Uh, yes, don't approach it as if you know what the science is, and science is a kind of trump card. That's probably not going to convince people. Do approach people in terms of their life, their everyday life, and how you connect with them in that everyday life in a given place, or you know what we're seeing in our local environments. Um, don't turn it into an I told you so, climate change is doing this, or something like that, but rather just connect with people where they are. Um, a lot of people around the world don't see things through a scientific lens. They see things through a religious, cultural, traditional, whatever kind of lens, and uh, respecting that lens is the first step to actually having a genuine conversation. Um, there are ways to talk about our um, our responsibility for the beautiful earth that we've been given with people who believe that uh, the earth was created for us humans, created for us to not trash, presumably. Even the Bible says so. So there are ways to have these conversations with people who, who, who have a different approach, a different perspective on things, but nevertheless, they're we can find common grounds. Um, oh, and final comment. Actually. I don't know why, but I can't help but comment that this made me think your focus on going back historically into epics and the beginning of the earth and the beginning of humans, like back to the natural order of things and how you tie in nature. What if the natural order of things is not for species to survive, survive for them to have their time on Earth and go extinct? And it happens lots of times, I presume, of their own volition. You know, the mammoth the leader takes them off the cliff, they're gone. <laughs> the volcanoes, the asteroids, it, it's beyond our uh, ability to shape it even though we think that all these things that we're doing now is shaping Earth to an Earth that we can't survive in. And, and actually, I, I buy into that to the most extent, but maybe that's the natural order of things. So yeah, so, that. sure. Yeah, so, so the question is, what if the natural order of things is an order where things live for a while and then go extinct? Whatever happens. And for sure, I mean, dinosaurs used to be huge all around the planet uh, for tens of millions of years. A long, long time, much longer than humans have, any, have had any kind of position of dominance. So our time has been very short. And, and therefore, that leads me to think that, that we're not necessarily fated to fade away quickly, fated with a T, to fade with a D away quickly. Maybe we will. We, we don't know. This, this is our kind of time to figure out how to live together with ourselves and with the others that we share the Earth with. And uh, I think that there are many planets in the universe where other forms of life will emerge and will have their own experiments. and, and um, there's nothing particularly special about ours, probably, but at the same time, this is what this is where we are, and and this is our life, and it's up to us to decide how to live it. And if we know that we can do something that creates more beauty, more harmony between ourselves and others, then why not do that? Dinosaurs didn't. Sorry. Dinosaurs 
slammed by uh, NASCAR. I mean, yeah. they didn't cause their own extinction. Yeah. yeah. We are causing our own extinction. That's the difference. I think what she needs to say is that we may lack the emotional hardware to pull off what we need to pull off. Yeah. It should be just made out of yeah. stuff. You know, yeah, yeah. So, so ultimately it's it kind possible. of comes down to yeah. whether we each have faith in ourselves as having the emotional hardware to pull it off. And I wouldn't be uh, teaching this stuff and working with students and we get great but, students uh, if I didn't think problems. that we had it. So you have to, you know, you have to get over some big problems we've been yes. working on for a long time, like war, you know, in yeah. competitive international relations, yeah. and all these things would have to be fixed simultaneously. That's a big, big ass. Yeah. Or, or you know, it's a heavy lift, as it says. Yeah. 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 So, so we have to start with understanding <laughs> ourselves yeah. and yeah. how we function. Yeah. Yes. I have one other question about the last quote that was up there, and it, mm -hmm. it started out with undecidability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It creates all these um, the curse, the promise of the current moment. Oh, okay. Is is it saying undecidability? is good or is that saying undecidability is not what we want to be like are you trying I, to say that's telling us we need to decide what to do and do it i think what the author means is that undecidability is the background the, the, the air that we breathe today we can't know for sure what will happen and what the future holds but it, but I, I'm sure the author doesn't mean that. Therefore, it doesn't matter what I decide to do in any given moment. So it's more a kind of global undecidability. It's that sort of, you know, uncharted waters feel that that anyone who looks into these things and studies them today feels that. You talk to climate scientists, and you know if. If, if they're not either um, seriously depressed, they're probably anxious and, and feeling this sense of unchartedness. So that, that, that's what I take from that quote. You had that question at the beginning, and uh, like, how would you define the time or something? What was the first question? How do you put, define the present? Uh, yes, how, how do you define the present time? After thinking about it for a few minutes, I thought of the word insecurity, like in being insecure. Yeah. So it's kind of like that, like this, this is unknown, a promise, curse, unknown, all this. Yeah. And that's, I don't know how many people have been in this place so, so much as a, a group of, of humans, so many of us not knowing. So. Yeah. Yeah, and if we think we know, then then pretty soon we might learn that we don't. Um, another word that that's like that is um, an anthropologist, Anand Singh, uh, talks about precarity as the global condition. Oh, that's good. Yeah, as increasingly becoming the global condition for more and more people. Yeah. I think we're out of time. <laughs>